It's good to see all of you. It's good to come and to worship God, especially if you're here as a guest, a visitor. Uh, we are really delighted to have you because we're here to worship a God who is like no other. Here's the Psalms. There's none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you've made shall come and bow down before you and glorify your name, for you are great and you do wondrous things. You alone are God. Wherever you are, whether it's here or at the Point campus or online, let's stand and let's worship God together.
There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history Sinners. For every curse his blood atones One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the rain was torn Sacrifice was made as the heavens roared, and all hail King Jesus, and all hail the Lord of heaven and earth, all hail King Jesus.
you guys can be seated. You know, I just had this vision as we were singing that of God. I mean, he's coming back. He's going to return. Can you imagine the Lord descending and us greeting him and just saying, all hail King Jesus? And just, I feel like we're not even going to be able to speak. We're going to be so um, in, in captured, I guess, by just by him and his presence again. So um, I love that song. You know, Psalm 36 says, your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness stretches to the skies. And just like the songs we sang earlier, these words remind us that there's no end to God's goodness and his faithfulness to us. And so as we give, uh, we trust him. You know, this is part of our worship as we bring our tithes and offerings to him. And so we trust this faithful and good God who loves us and cares for us. So please join me now. Oh, by the way, as always, you can give online if you prefer. We have a Dropbox um, at back as well if you'd like to do a handwritten check. So let's go to the Lord now in prayer as we thank him and dedicate our offerings. Almighty God, you have given us everything. Not only did you create us, but you provide for our every need. Thank you, God, for the gift of life and for your loving care. Thank you for your guiding hand on us and your love within us. In all these things, Lord, make us wise to make good use of your benefits, that we may render an acceptable thanksgiving to you all the days of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, my name is Dave, and I serve on the First Impressions team here at Hunt Valley, and it's very good to be with you this morning. I'm glad you're here. It's a gorgeous day out there. You know, now that the eclipse is behind us, you're probably asking yourself, how is our church reaching and impacting the community? So I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> if you scan the QR code on the seat in front of you with your phone, that'll take you to the Hunt Valley Church website, which has been described as, and I quote, more informative than Wikipedia, and more addictive than Netflix. Um, so just in case you left your phone in your pocket, there's two particular things I want to highlight for us this morning. First is our clothing collection. As followers of the Lord, you know, we're called to serve and care for those around us. And one practical way that we do this is we gather gently used clothing and provide that for those in need. And we partner with an organization called The Well. And The Well uh, supports the Curtis Bay community in Baltimore. So if you do have some items that you don't wear anymore, please consider um, pulling them together. Next Sunday is the last day for the spring collection, so if you could bring them next week, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. And then next is an event focused on reaching the unreached. So there's about 8 billion people walking planet Earth right now as we speak. Um, you know, most of them will be on the highway tomorrow morning trying to prevent you from getting to your job on time. But of the 8 billion, about 3.4 billion live in what's known as unreached people groups. So these are people that have little or no access to the message of Jesus and the gospel. And so what is happening for these people? Well, on Tuesday, April 23rd, um, we're going to host an event where you can learn how God is at work through the people around the world to reach these unreached people. And it's going to be an interactive, it's going to be a, a cool evening. So um, I know I live like a lot of my life in my own little cocoon of concern and, you know, things I'm worried about personally. But when I go to an event like this, um, it just blows my mind typically. And I'm, and I'm amazed at the ways God is working and the way he is working through his people to save and uh, give the knowledge of the gospel. So I definitely encourage you to make time in your calendar for that. It's not this Wednesday, but it's the Wednesday, or excuse me, it's the, not this Tuesday, but the Tuesday following. So thank you so much for that. Speaking of this great God that we love and serve, let's go to him now as we um, pray to him. Please join me as we pray. Lord, our minds are like hornet's nests of worry and planning and distractions. Settle our hearts now as we come before you. Quiet us and be with us in these few moments. Psalm 139 begins, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, you know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. 
God, we acknowledge your sovereignty over all aspects of our lives. We fret and try to control outcomes. Remind us in our stress that you know us completely. You love us intimately. You are good and true. From Jeremiah, you speak these words. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Thank you, God, for sticking with us from start to finish on this earthly journey. We rejoice that not even death can separate us from your love, for you will still be with us on the other side of eternity. We take comfort in your word that says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. We think we know where we're going but you actually know. Help us to be flexible to your leading and guidance, both individually and as a community. Help us to trust you fully, whatever comes. Lord God, we pray this morning for our next senior pastor. We ask that you would give great clarity to him as well as the search committee. And we thank you for continuing to provide for our church in this time of waiting. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness to us as we face the challenges and struggles of life. You told us in this world we will have trouble, but that you have overcome the world, and in you we may have peace, and we rest in this truth. Thank you, God, that you are for us. You didn't spare your own son, but gave him up for us all. Jesus is our life and our hope, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So the good-looking fellow that kicked off our service this morning is Frank Boswell. He's our pastor emeritus, and Frank will be bringing us the message this morning after our scripture reading. Our scripture reading is from the books of Genesis, Ephesians, and Revelation. We will begin in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. From Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. And from the book of Revelation, chapters 19 and 21. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who were invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Well, did you have a nice uh, eclipse? I thought the hoopla was way overdone until about noon on Monday when I realized, well, I can see it off my balcony. So I ran off and I got some glasses and watched. And I mean, it is eerie. It's impressive to see. Uh, what was it? 87, 8% covered in Baltimore, the sun. But it wasn't 87% darker, which is odd to me. My brother in Chicago uh, lives downtown in a high rise, took a picture and sent it to me. It looked like any other sunny day in Chicago. They had 94% coverage, and he said, can you say (laughs) anti-climax? But my son lived in Ohio, right in the totality zone, and he went out with his family to a site, and they took some moon pies and sun chips and eclipse gum. (laughs) And my son, who's not given to poetry, but he said, Dad, 
It was cool, but when it went totally dark, it was an entirely different kind of thing. It was amazing. I don't have the words to describe it. And then I heard a commentator say the same thing. She flew all the way from the East Coast to Texas to see this thing. And she said, you want to know the difference between 90% eclipse and 100% eclipse? It's the same as the difference between 0% eclipse and 100% eclipse. I've never seen that. And I guess I never will. That was my last eclipse, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but it was, stirs up something in people that's quite extraordinary. But there's more to the story. <laughs> I did not realize until this eclipse that the uh, sun is 400 times bigger than the moon. But it's 400 times the exact amount further away so that the sun, the moon, perfectly covers up the sun and an eclipse. And this is a coincidence. Uh, I'm quoting an atheist astronomer, Neil deGrasse. He says, it's a coincidence not shared by any other planet-moon combination in the system, the solar system. We have the best eclipses in the solar system. Wait, there's more. <laughs> the moon used to be larger in the past. And if it was still large, it would uh, block the chromosphere and part of the corona. We wouldn't be able to see what we see now. And if you fast forward a few million years, the moon will be too distant to totally block it out. We have to be at just the right time and place to be able to see an eclipse. And it all has to, has to be when the sun is at a certain luminosity for this to work. Oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> the moon... Is lunar mass is just a little more than 1% of the Earth's mass. And that's not matched by any other moon in the solar system. The, 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 the largest moon is Titan, but it's only a very small part of the mass of Jupiter. Our moon is 52 times bigger than Titan relative to the mass of the Earth. And this is important because... It maintains the Earth's slight rotation axis just right. Keeps us on a pretty steady tilt so that we are able to have stability for advanced life. And then, then you've got the tidal forces of the moon for the past four and a half billion years, which have slowly slowed our, our rotation rate down to 24 hours a day. Not 23 and not 25, because both of those would disrupt climate on Earth and make it difficult for any life to survive. It has to be, believe it or not, 24 hours. It can only be that if the, earth, the moon is not more nor less than around 1% of the mass of the earth. And all of this had to happen just at the time where the sun's luminosity hit a certain peak stability. And the moon also rescued earth from losing all of its atmosphere and surface water that has something to do with the molten cores and the magnetosphere that is set up. And I'm just throwing out cool words to impress you now. <laughs> this is what Genesis 1 is about. I, we really waste a lot of time and energy approaching it as though it were some sort of scientific textbook. Why would God write a scientific textbook for people thousands of years ago? But it doesn't mean it's unscientific. You want to hear unscientific? Try this out. The material universe was rooted in great waste of water, sweet water and salt water, which personified as two gods, male and female. Creation begins as intercourse between the male and the female. Then war arises between the parents and the children. The kids are like secondary gods. One of them kills the father, but the female is the greater threat. But the hero god Marduk is elected leader. He overthrows her. He ultimately shapes earth and sky from her dead body. That's how the world came about. Now look, all of those ancient cosmologies were like that. And they all pretty much assumed everything had always been here. And, and you read philosophers and, and other historians and they say there's only one group of people who had a story, anything like this, and it's the Jews. And the very first thing it says is God created the heavens and the earth. There's order. There is structure. You don't have intrigue. You don't have jealousies. You don't have rivals. There's no wars going on. He's supreme and unchallenged. The book of Genesis is deconstructing all those pagan myths. J. Sedlow Bacter says, In the beginning, God. That denies atheism, which says there is no God. It also denies polytheism, which says there are a whole bunch of gods. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God 
created. That denies fatalism, the idea that everything just happens by random chance. And it also denies evolution with its doctrine of infinite becoming. God created the heavens and the earth. That denies pantheism, which makes God and the universe identical. All of the Eastern religions think that way. And it denies materialism. You know, your average college professor in these areas, which says that matter is eternal. And it certainly says it wasn't us. In the beginning, not you or me, not sin either. We're looking at the world before everything got messed up. And uh, we can scarcely imagine what that world is like. We are characters in his story. The name for God, Elohim, appears 35 times in 34 verses because it's behind him. Behind everything we see on a gorgeous day like today is not randomness and meaninglessness and pointlessness and chance, but purpose and intent and wonderful creativity. That's why we're dealing with foundations. This is foundational, just the same way as certain mathematical axioms are essential for building more advanced mathematics. Now, back then, they used to believe the universe was the remains of once-living gods. Today, we think it just sprang somehow out of inert matter, although nobody has ever been able to show how that happened. And then we look at the size of the universe. A lot of people will look at that and say, how can there be a god? And we just have this one little blue marble on the edge of an average galaxy, and, you know, there's kajillions. What's the word? There's billions of trillions of galaxies in the universe. Well, it turns out that the universe has to be as massive as it is in order for human life to be possible. And it goes back to the, big, the hot Big Bang. It's not just the Big Bang anymore. It is the hot Big Bang, just so you know. And it had to proceed at a certain rate. If it was too fast, then certain elements wouldn't be created. If it was too slow, certain elements wouldn't be created. And the speed of that expansion creates this massiveness and it boils down to this, in the words of Hugh Ross, I like this, the creator of the universe considered humans to be of such value that he willingly and meticulously crafted a universe of 50 billion trillion stars and 100 times more mass besides just to produce an appropriate planet to be their home. Come on, that's cool. And that's exactly what Genesis 1 is saying. You know, in the other ancient stories, the, uh, the, hum uh, the humans were there just to serve the gods and bring them offerings and everything. But this is different because God does all this to make a nice place for us. Nancy Piercy, I love this illustration. She says, suppose you had a machine which could create a universe. I know it's silly, but this machine would have thousands of dials. And on each of the dials, it would have certain settings on it that could be adjusted one way or the other for the gravitational constant and the nuclear force and the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force and all that other stuff that I avoided taking classes on. And every one of those dials has to be set just right. If any one of them is even a degree or two off, it all falls apart. And yet for some strange reason, it is all exactly right. Even the non believing, atheistic, even hostile people like Richard Dawkins are saying, boy, the universe looks like it was made just for us, but don't believe your eyes. <laughs> In denial. Well, and then there's animals. A lot of ancient stories don't even talk about the animals. They don't care about it. God likes the animals. He made a whole bunch of weird ones. One of the most disturbing things to me about God is some of the animals that he has created. <laughs> Father Capon imagines the Trinity, uh, the Father, Son, and the Spirit kind of outdoing each other. One makes a giraffe, and the other says, oh, yeah, well, look at this. And he makes a hippopotamus. <laughs> but another one does a duck-billed duck -billed platypus. Thank you. <laughs> Some kind of extraterrestrial-looking creature, you know? And then there's the bowerbird. You know anything about the bowerbird? The bowerbird. I went on YouTube this morning and looked at the bowerbird. They, he spends all this time collecting twigs and branches to make a little chapel-like structure. And he, then he goes off and gets shiny objects and puts them in there to attract a female. And then he does a dance. 
Now, it's just funny, because just the other day, I heard uh, a classic song on the radio by the Contours called, Do You Love Me? And if you don't know it, I mean, it, it's before a lot of your time, but so is Beethoven. <laughs> I can mash potato. I can do the twist. Now tell me, baby, do you like it like this? Tell me, tell me, tell me, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You know this one? Do you love me now that I can dance? Watch me now. That's how the song goes. And somebody needs to get, edit a clip of the Bower Bird with that soundtrack and put it on YouTube. Now, we know that there's some kind of evolution, small horses to big horses and, and uh, various birds and so forth. We can see feathers and colors and these. But even if you get the hardware evolved, how do you account for the instructions for the bower bird dance or anything else? Or even, you, we all have this incredibly complicated sequential DNA coding it's like the software that tells the hardware what to do. Where does the coding come from? Nobody has an answer to that, unless you read Genesis 1. And I think as we work through this chapter, there's something about God. I think he just built this, this silly bird dance in here, saying, it's me, the same one who made you want to sing, do you dance by the contours. You see, there's, there's synchronicity there. Well... Genesis 1 is about exaltation, not explanation. It calls us to be filled with a sense of wonder and gratitude. And James Kushner says, a little boy looking in wonder at the stars knows more reality and truth and wisdom than a scientist who's staring through a telescope and doesn't understand what it even means. And I went through all of this just to emphasize that when you get to the climax of this chapter, we're dealing with this, this orderly God, this spectacular, wondrous God. And the culmination of all of his creative effort is the creatures of the sixth day. That's who we are. Now, I, I think the day is just a poetic framework for telling a story that's true, but it's not about, I don't think it's about sequence, and I don't think it's about scientific details of creation, but I think it's telling truth that science can't tell us. And that's it. We're the culmination of God's purpose and intent in creation. Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make. Stop right there. Up to now, he's been saying, let there be, let there be, let there be. Suddenly, let us. Who's us? <laughs> A lot, if not most scholars, think he, he's addressing the heavenly court, as it were. Let us. It's sort of a, a royal, plural of majesty, but it's dramatic. It slows things down. And he said, let's make in our image. Now, as Andy Crouch says, at no point before this has there been any sense that the created world bears any resemblance to the creator. But well, this, what is about to happen next, is different. And it's said no less than four times. God wants to establish his rule and governance over the world he's just made by means of image bearers, not dogs, cats, porpoises, or chimpanzees, but human Beings, and I want to ask you something. Who went to see the eclipse this week? Did you see dogs lined up with glasses to watch? <laughs> I mean, I think this is more, I think almost more interesting than the eclipse is us. I mean, we talked about it for months ahead of time. We book travel, we go down roads, which we've made, and fly jets that we've invented, and we go there and put on these glasses because we've done studies on how to protect our eye. I mean, there's nothing else anywhere in this creation that is even remotely like us. We are God-like people. And, and, and the simple evolution, if by that we just mean chance and material, does not account for what I think is the most obvious thing about us. You tell me who's closing their eyes to evidence. Now, on the one hand, we are made from the earth. In Hebrew, that's Adama. And the man is named Adam. He's earthly. But there's a whole story about how God breathes into him and personally fashions him. We are royal. We're not God. We're just images of God. But we're images of God. We're not mere products of natural selection working off random genetic mutation, says Plantinga. So there's a basis for value and dignity. 
And I can't stress this strongly enough. It is Christianity and, and the Jewish scriptures that planted this idea in the world that there's value and dignity to the poor and the disabled and all the rest. We say all people are created equal, but if we don't believe in creation, then we can't believe in equality, and it will degenerate to the powerful doing whatever they want to the weak. And the further we turn from the Christianity, the more we will see that. But the focus isn't on the nature of human beings here. It's really on the rule of human beings. God is a ruler. He's made them in his image. He wants them to rule and govern. Not exploit, but, but manage properly. So God created mankind, verse 27, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, both of them. Verse 28, he blessed them and said to them together be fruitful and increase, which, by the way, is hard to do all by yourself. You need two people. We are purpose-built creatures, and they were to fill the world, and then they were to form the world, to subdue it, and to uh, draw out its potentialities. And uh, what it's really envisioning is a whole cultural enterprise that results in civilization. The world is not a finished product. There are all kinds of... There was no iPhone in the Garden of Eden. That's a product of cultural development over centuries. There's an unfolding of creation. And in the Bible, we start in a garden and we end in a city. Good thing Adam has a partner because he really needs one. Now, this is the completion and the culmination of God's work as the creatures of the sixth day. We are the best part of creation. But actually, wait... There's more. <laughs> the creation of the woman. The creation of the woman goes into all kinds of detail. Verse 18. It's not good for the man to be alone. And uh, that's the first time. That's rather jarring as you read through here. Everything's good. It's going great. But there's something not good. And so God slows us down. God himself is a communion of persons. He is a little... Society, I guess. No word quite does justice to the mystery of the Trinity, but he's not solitary. He's a community unto himself. And so Adam, who's made in the image of God, is, doesn't have a personal counterpart in all of creation. And God makes it clear, verse 19, he formed out of the ground all the wild animals and birds, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them, which is a process of identifying and classifying and and all of that. In verse 20, the man gave names to them, but there was no suitable helper. So verse 21, God causes the man to fall into a deep sleep, takes one of his ribs, and fashions her out of the ground. God didn't go to this much trouble with the man. And it shows. <laughs> the Lord made a woman from the rib, not from the head, not from the foot, not even from the dirt from the rib. And, and the word made is, is a special kind of, of fashioning and tailoring the work of a supreme craftsman. I mean, he is going to get this right. I don't feel like I can do justice to everything in here, but can you tell? This means something. It is not our imagination. It's significant what he does here. But my favorite part, notice it says he, uh, verse... 22 says he brought her to the man. Now, when you go to a lot of trouble to create a gift for somebody, do you not want to see how they're going to respond? <laughs> what is God thinking? I mean, the God who invented the bower bird and all this stuff. <laughs> what is God thinking? Uh, he's got to be excited. And then verse 23, it sounds like caveman talk. But in fact, this is the first poetry in the Bible. But there's a lot of poetry in the Bible, and sometimes only poetry will do justice to things we want to communicate. And it's the only word we have from Adam before the fall into sin, right here in verse 23. Uh, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she'll be called woman. He names her just as he did the animals. And Well, let me translate it for you. He's looking at her, and he's saying, you complete me. And she looks at him and she says, you had me at hello. 
And we watch all these movies and we write innumerable songs and, and novels and dramas and poetry and we just can't get over this dynamic between, between men and women. The whole experience of falling in love. Has that happened to you yet? And if it hasn't, don't you wish it would because you've heard about it and there's some kind of unnamed longing in you which is just not explicable on other terms than the Christian biblical terms. Falling in love is not believing your eyes. I've been there. And I, uh, I think I embarrass my wife when I say this, but it was a religious experience. And I've never gotten over that. And I, I thought, what's wrong with me? This feels like more than just attraction and liking somebody and wanting to spend your life and all saying a lot of mushy-gushy things. There was something deeper. It's, it's almost mystical. And I think it is. I think God built it in. I think that's what Adam was saying. I think Adam is saying, this is the best part of creation right here. And how do you think she feels when she hears that? Well, verse 24 says, that's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. And Jesus quotes this. It's not even a command. It's just like a statement of fact, you know, because of the way God made us, men leave their whole life behind and they do. They suddenly drop everything and they go in pursuit of this one magical creature. Jesus did treat it as normative, though, and important. You have to leave. And again, there are no parallels in ancient literature for this kind of thing. You bet all the marbles, you burn all the bridges. It's about absolute loyalty and commitment. You know, they've done studies. And uh, Adam Golovin says that enduring connection in marriage results more from the intentional efforts of the spouses than it does from spontaneous love and emotional spark. End quote. I mean, soulmate sounds great and... Uh, but if I mean by that this perfect person that makes it all come together so that when I finally discover this person is a clunk and has got real issues, I need to bail, well, then soulmate's not a helpful idea. There's no perfect person. The only people you can marry are sinners on this side of Eden that are really screwed up, which is why you need the commitment. Anthony Esselin says, a sociology professor comes along and asks people, how you could possibly make a vow of permanence when you can't predict what the future have in store. He says the people look at him as if he'd lost his senses. That's precisely why they make the vow, because we can't know what's in store. Anthony Esselin says love is an act of the will which creates a bond and a commitment that a mere feeling can only hint at. For feelings are like the weather, but love is like the good, solid earth beneath. So the man leaves. The man leaves. He, he makes the journey. He builds the bower bird nest and does the dance. Then they are united together in an exclusive relationship. Have you heard of polyamory? This is the latest buzzy thing in our liberated society. Kay Heimowitz says, according to a 2023 Pew Research study, the majority, the majority of Generation Zers have given the practice a good housekeeping seal of approval. 51% of adults younger than 30 agree that open marriage is cool. Well, come back in 20 years. Tell us how that's working. I mean, there's a wisdom here that has stood the test of time. But God, who designed the bower bird and the moon and the earth and the stars and all of that, has designed this as well. When are we going to take that seriously? Somebody came to me years ago and said, I, I need to talk to you. I, what is the church's position on homosexuality? My heart always skips a beat in these conversations, in this climate, and it's so hard to be heard. And I said, why? You ask. Well, my brother is gay. Uh, which is not a category in the Bible, but I understand what this person is saying. The same-sex attraction. And I love my brother, and I, I'm just so worried. I said, well, God loves your brother too. But let me ask you, do you think God made us? I had to think about it a moment. Yeah. Do you think that he brought intent 
an intelligence to that? When he made men a certain way, and he made women a certain way, do you think he had purpose and intent? Was there meaning to all of that? Yeah, there has to be. I said, well, does anything about homosexual relations fit that? No. Now, I know that raises a host of questions, but you can't answer those questions unless you get your first foundational things straight. Did God or did God not create things? Did he not, or did he not create us male and female? Transgenderism, not transgender people, not bashing or scorning or looking down on people suffering from gender dysphoria. I'm talking about this insidious ism, the ideology that's beating us all up. It's just Gnosticism in new form. That's an ancient heresy. And it's a heresy which minimized the material world and said the secret and key to life is inside of us in some secret wisdom. And so you have people say, I don't care what my body is or my assigned gender at birth. Inside, my secret wisdom tells me I'm something else in spite of all the material world. That's Gnosticism, and it's a denial of the materiality of the world that God has made. I'm just being descriptive, not mean to be mean-spirited here. They're to be united in a way that only men and women can really be united and then produce one flesh like a baby. Only men and women can do that. And they become one flesh. And the first place you see it is this little bundle. Oh, it's got his eyes, got her chin. So cute for now. <laughs> that was a cheap shot. I'm sorry. But who hasn't been astounded at the wonder of all of that? Now look, uh, Andrew Tate is a big voice, uh, an influencer today. He says, the problem is there's zero advantage to marriage in the Western world for a man. Look at the advantage of getting married. There are absolutely none. Another influencer, Pearl Davis, said, modern marriage is a death sentence to men. And an increasingly large percentage of young adults ages 18 to 40, think education is more important, money is more important, and critical to fulfillment than getting married. People are getting married less and less, which means we're having less and less babies, which means we're starting a de demographic downward cycle, which spells disaster down the road. And when God said, go out and multiply, he meant it. And I've known Christians who suddenly realize, wait a minute, Children aren't just lifestyle accessories. If we're able, and I know not everybody is, but if we're able to have children, we really should. That's God's plan. I know there's all these voices talking about overpopulation. That's, a, that's another discussion. But you should listen to this voice. And I've known so many people who said, I had no idea that having children would be so rewarding. It's just about killed me. But it's... It's magnificent, and you don't know it until you do it. Well, the Gallup data from 2020 to 23 says that marital status is a stronger predictor of well-being for American adults in education, or race, or age, or gender. The most uh, striking conclusion from all this data and these studies is that marriage confers its mental health benefits regardless of whether you're male or female, young or old, rich and poor, uneducated or educated, white, non-white, all of those things. Now look, some of us are called to be single. And even if you're a married person, you may end up spending a significant part of your life single. So there's nothing subhuman about being single. Jesus was single. Paul was single. I just need to give that disclaimer. But single people have a vested interest in marriage. Marriage needs to be upheld and valued by all people, including the United States Congress, by the way. They aren't gods either in dictating what marriage is and is not. Brad Wilcox says, when it comes to predicting overall happiness, marriage is more important than anything else. He goes, Katie Foss says, if you want a fulfilling life, not only get married, get pregnant. You don't hear that very much, but you hear it in Genesis now, Brad Wilcox says, I was raised by a single mom. I'm doing fine. But as a sociologist, I can tell you that on average, kids and communities are more likely to thrive when they're rooted in strong married families. If you wish to 
save civilization, quote unquote. You should care about the health of marriage. There's more to stake with marriage than our fulfillment. And marriage has its own integrity because God designed it. We're not free to redesign it, and we're not free to ignore it or trample it. Now, there's one more thing that we need to grasp about marriage, and, and here's where words just completely fail me, and it took me a long time to even see this. But I think this whole drama of the man and the woman is like a little code for what all of history is about. Look at Ephesians 5 that was read a few moments ago. Paul quotes, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And then he says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. What? Oh, we just haven't been reading our Bibles very closely, but throughout the Old Testament, God calls Israel his bride. He sometimes describes the time in the wilderness at, at Sinai as like a wedding ceremony. He says in Hosea, I will betroth you to me forever. And then you come to the New Testament, and John the Baptist says, I'm not the Messiah. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. John the Baptist says Jesus is the groom. Well, who's that? Well, that's God. And Jesus does his first miracle at a wedding where they're running out of wine. And then Mary comes to him and says, do something. Why did she go to Jesus to do that? Because it's the bridegroom's responsibility to see that there's enough wine for the wedding feast. Wow. And then you get to the end of the book in Revelation. And you've got monsters, you've got plagues, you've got horrors galore. But that's not how it ends. It ends with a wedding ceremony. It says in 21.2 of Revelation, I saw the city coming down prepared as a bride. Now that's a mixing of metaphors. And I, I can only say that the reality of what this is about must go far beyond anything we can imagine but if you think marriage is great, and if you think everything that a marriage is about, the peak moments are wonderful, it's just the tip of, on the tongue of what God has in mind. Christopher West says Christianity is the religion of the union of God with the human race. And we saw it in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And the sexual revolution has just washed so much of this away and scarred us in so many ways. I love the way Anthe Esselin, because he is a, a poet, and he says, people give their lives to give life, and their promise to be true to one another, come what may, means more than that they will accept the indefinite. It means that they will be open to the infinite, for they do not know what life may spring from their loins and who the children of their children shall be. They are a chapter in a story they've received and not made and whose end they will not see in this world. Getting married and staying married is a profound act of faith in the larger story of the marriage of God with the community of humankind redeemed by Jesus Christ. Now, it's funny, out of all the things I read, I really crammed this week, probably put too much in here too, but... Anthony Esselin, his story when his father died. When the crisis came, he says, and his breath began to rattle, we gathered round him. His wife and his four children, we told him we loved him. But in the last moment, he had eyes for one person. He turned towards my mother, his eyes very wide, as if he'd gone blind and were staring hard to find her face. He tried to whisper, so she bent her ear towards his lips. I love you, he said. And they were his last words on earth. He had never known any other woman, and she had never known any other man. I think the words, I love you, are what the groom said to us when he died on the cross. Why did he do that? It was for love. And on the last night of his life, when Jesus was meeting with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. I give my body to you. 
And after the supper, he held up the cup and said, this is my blood which is poured out for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. When you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so when we come to this table, we are saying to all intents and purposes that we, we subscribe to the story that begins in Genesis 1 and ends in Revelation and centers on the redemptive work, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're declaring our faith to the world. That's why it's important before a person participates in this, they need to come to that conviction and they need to put themselves under the authority of a local church. So if you're a member of a church somewhere and you declare this, join with us in declaring this truth, please join us around this table. If you're on the way and you haven't quite become a member and aligned yourself and declared your faith publicly, do that first. And it includes our kids that are growing up in this church. But we do this this morning in honor of him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for mysteries beyond our comprehension. Like the eclipse, we just look and slack-jawed wonder and amazement. We get pleasure and fear at the same time out of how grand all of this is. And then you invite us to supper. We take this simple bread and this cup, and we thank you for communing with us right here, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Trays will be passed, and uh, if you're partaking this morning, there's two cups. Be sure you get them both on top of each other with the bread and the juice, and hold it until everybody is served and we can partake together. Before Jesus could die as a substitute, he had to become a human being. So Christmas is a story of how the creator of Genesis 1 actually becomes one of the creatures he has fashioned, born in the womb of a woman, born just like all of us. And then he offers himself up as a sacrifice on the cross. This is my body, he said, which is for you. Eat and remember him.
Lord God, we thank you that in the body, Jesus Christ obeyed you perfectly. He was a human being. We should be, we'll never be. We thank you that he died a death he should never have died. We should have. And then he rose on our behalf, and we thank you in his name. Amen. After the supper, he held up the cup and said, This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of all your sins. When you drink this, remember me. Thank you, Lord, for the refreshment of this meal, the simple communion of it with each other and with you and for the promise of the future. Thank you for Jesus' words that he would come again. And now as we're in this betrothal period and we wait for the bridegroom, Lord, may we be faithful to him. We look so forward to that day, and we thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you to stand. Uh, David will be out by this Connect flag outside the door here. If you want to talk, ask questions, interact, if you're new to the church or whatever, be glad to do that. I hope you will just greet the people around you before you go. And now, in the words of the Apostle Paul, the depths and the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond finding out. For from him and through him and for him are all things, To him be the glory forever. Amen.